Pete's going to discuss in more detail some of the things that is helping the game prosper. Pete Pavakwis has had a distinguished career as a national leader in the game. He started right here in the Met area, worked as a caddy and in the golf shop at Bedford Golf and Tennis, while starring as a student and an athlete at Brunswick School in Greenwich. Pete briefly practiced law in New York City after graduating from Notre Dame. Five and one, not too bad, good start. And Georgetown Law. But fortunately for the golf world, he turned his love of the game into his career. He started with the USGA, becoming their first chief business officer and their first managing director. Today, he is the CEO of the PGA of America. He heads one of the largest organizations in sports. He is the chair of the World Golf Foundation. He helps lead the executive committee of Golf 2020 is engaged in bringing golf back into the Olympics, and far too many more accomplishments to mention. I noticed that one thing you left out on your bio, and I know it's one of his proudest moments, Pete and his wife Tiffany won the mixed member guest with my wife and I <laughs> at Ball's Roll 10 years ago. That's, that's amazing. He's uniquely qualified to talk to us today. He is he and the PGA of America are at the forefront of developing programs that will help grow our game. It's now my my good pleasure to introduce our good friend Pete Pavako. Well, no, thanks, Steve. And I would say it's probably my proudest achievement, not one of my proudest achievements. That was that was a great day. First, a little bit of a warning. I'm fresh back from Korea for the President's Cup, and I kind of have a little bit of vertigo, believe it or not. Uh, as I said to Jeff Holshu and Steve Boyd, I, I kind of feel a little bit like Jason Day at Chambers Bay. So if I, uh, not my game, unfortunately, just the uh, vertigo. So if I stumble or take a moment, you know what it is. But, uh, you know, as Steve said, I grew up in this area, and this area means so much to me. Those, those formative days at Bedford Golf and Tennis, really learning the game under the guidance of the PGA professional, Walt Ronan, is what got me hooked. That and just a seminal moment in 1984 where I went to the U.S. Open at Wingfoot with my father, and we were there on the 72nd hole on Sunday right next to Fuzzy Zeller, and Norman was up there. Fuzzy thought he made a birdie. He made that great putt for par threw it into a Monday playoff. We were by Fuzzy as he was waving the white towel and I was just hooked on this game. And even though I went off to Notre Dame and to Georgetown and spent some time at a law firm in the city, Davis Polk, I knew I always wanted to get back into golf. And you know, before I get into the, the PGA and our strategic plan, you know, there are three people in this room that really, during that time, during my, my teenage years and, and through my time at Davis Polk and certainly at the USGA, just really had a profound impact on me and are so responsible for what I'm doing here. And, and one is certainly Jay Matola. You know, to think what Jay has done for the NGA, his guidance, his leadership, I am someone he's taken under his wing. Uh, he, what he's done for golf in this area and really around the country is just can never be repaid. So thank you, Jay. <laughs> I look right down here and I see Charlie Robson, who is a, a legend of all legends at the PGA of America. What he's done for the Mets section over four decades of service, guiding the PGA and obviously one of its most critical and biggest sections, being a huge influence on what we're doing at the national level. And another person, when I was contemplating uh, this role, when I was going through my time at the USGA, and certainly since I started at the PGA of America, someone I can always go to for an honest appraisal. What am I doing right? What could I be doing better? And to think that we have two people in this room that have guided this area in golf with Jay and Charlie is just amazing. So, Charlie, thank you. And, and lastly, and uh, he's going to get mad at me because I tell this story a lot, but I have to, is uh, one of my favorite all-time people is Gene Westmoreland. You know, and I grew up absolutely petrified of Gene. I, I spent my youth uh, very unsuccessfully trying to play in all these great MGA events, trying to qualify for the Med Am, trying to qualify for the Med Open, trying to qualify for the Ike. And it only there's that great Seinfeld episode with Jerry and the pilot. 
and the pilot would freeze up whenever he saw Jerry, and Jerry would freeze up when he saw the pilot. I, Gene didn't freeze up when he saw me, but I froze up when I saw Gene. Every time I saw Gene on his rules card, I would either hit a ball in the woods or shank a shot. And, uh, and then I had this, this kind of epiphany moment. I was at Notre Dame, I was a junior. I was driving up toward the Concord to try to qualify in the Ike in, in one of the worst cars ever made, the, the, uh, the Cadillac Cimarron, the caddy that zigs. I had uh, my, it didn't really zig, I had my father in the front seat, my best friend Larry in the back seat who was going to caddy for me, and the engine seized about halfway up. And I'm like, this is before cell phones, I'm like, ah, well, so much for that. But my father, who had a never die attitude, was like, oh, no, no, we're going to, we'll, we'll get a tow truck. And we, we walked into town and we called a tow truck from a payphone and the tow truck towed us to the golf course. And I was in the front seat with the tow truck driver and my dad and my best friend were in the Cadillac getting towed and pulled into the parking lot and I was a good 20 minutes late for my tea time. But, but this was the moment when I saw that even golf executives could show compassion and have flexibility. Gene allowed me to start in a different group, uh, didn't give me the two-stroke penalty. I went on to shoot probably uh, 84 or 85, missed the cut, but it was one of those great moments, and Gene has been a real friend to me and to the PGA of America for years, so thank you, Gene. But, you know, when I got the role as the CEO of the PGA of America, I went in there and quickly realized that we needed to develop a strategic plan. It's been, it had been a good organization doing great things, but never really had a footprint, never really had a game plan. And we said, you know, with the officers and the board, that we need to do that. We need to put a plan together. We need to know where, we, where we're going to be in the next four or five or 10 years. And we also said, hey, that's gonna take some time. And as we're developing that plan, let's have some short-term victories. So before I get into the long-term plan and what we're trying to do to serve our members and grow the game, I think it's worth spending a little bit of time on what we did in the interim. And we took a step back and said, okay, as we're giving ourselves a year or a year and a half to fully bake out a long-term strategic plan, what should we concentrate on? And we focused on communication, we focused on changing the culture at headquarters, and we certainly focused on, again, as I said, some short-term victories. With communication, what I said throughout the interview process and having been in golf really my whole life from, from different angles, is there was a, a disconnect between the organization and the membership. Now, the PGA of America did a lot of great things for golf, but I always saw that there was a bit of a disconnect. How could we bridge that disconnect? How could we start to narrow that gap? How could we heal that lack of commu communication? So it really started, we started on a far more aggressive communication plan internally. Let's make sure that staff is talking to one another. We quickly realized that we were a bit of a hybrid organization. In one sense, we were sports business. We had a good sports business enterprise. We run two of the five biggest events in golf in the PGA Championship and the Ryder Cup. And we would do deals around that. Deals with Mercedes, deals with Omega, deals with a Samsung and our patrons. <clears throat> and then we were a membership-based organization, education and employment. And in the halls of the PGA of America, very often those two groups weren't talking to each other. And I saw, and I think others saw, that very often the tail was wagging the dog. What we were doing on the sports business side <clears throat> was influencing too much what we were doing on the membership side. And we said that's lack, that starts with a lack of communication among the membership, to the membership. And it was really just pushing out information from headquarters to the membership. And we said, let's start a dialogue. Let's make sure that we're not just talking to the membership from our perch at National, but that we invite them in. And that starts with better communication between the senior staff and our officers. Better communication between senior staff and our board of directors. I was surprised that when I got there, we really only met with the board formally three times or four times a year. And I said, that's not good enough. We shouldn't let 30 days go by where we're not having a conversation with the board of directors. So we established a call at the end of every month, you know, a one hour call, a 90 minute call, where we'll go through 10, 12 key topics. What's going on? What are our challenges? What are we trying to do to grow the game? Or what are some business initiatives we're developing? And that level of communication between the staff, from the staff to the board, ultimately from the organization to its memberships, I think has started to pay dividends. And we clearly realized that one of the ultimate areas where we had to improve on communication was between our staff and our sections. How could we get the viewpoint of a Charlie Robson? 
how could we get the viewpoint of his 40 peers around the country? Because a national, if you're stuck in Palm Beach Gardens, sure, you get kind of the big trends in golf, you understand that, but you're not living it at the local level, at the sectional level. And that, that back and forth of communication makes us smarter. Our greatest strength as an organization by a mile isn't the fact that we run the Ryder Cup or the PGA Championship. It's the fact that we represent 28,000 people who wake up every day and really serve as the tangible connection between the game and everybody that plays it around this country. Whether you're at Baltus Royal or you're at a nine-hole public facility in Wichita, Kansas, chances are it's that PGA of America professional connecting you to the game. People like Mickey Gallagher, who talks and lives and breathes this game every day, we're smarter if we bring Mickey into the fold, and we weren't doing a good enough job about with that. Culture was another key area. The PGA of America was a bit of a battleship, going along, doing some good things, but not progressive enough, not fast enough, not willing enough to call an audible. And we said, we need to change the culture here. It's little things, I, 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 with my, where my office is situated in the PGA of America, this very kind of hierarchical sense of what it meant to be on the staff, we tried to tear down those walls and I made the statement that whether you're there, you're fresh out of college and you've been there for three months, or you're Kerry Hague and you've been there for 25 years, your viewpoint is important, your viewpoint is going to be accepted, and we want to hear it. And somebody who's in the merchandise department might have a great idea about how to grow the game. And somebody in the championship department might have a wonderful idea about education. And if we can foster that open discourse and dialogue among each other, we're going to be smarter and more prepared. And culture is an ongoing battle. It's not something where you can snap your fingers and change it overnight. It's a 10, 20 year battle. And just when you think you have it figured out, it ends. And I went to a seminar, and maybe, probably some of you have heard this, but I wrote it down and I stick to it. That no matter what kind of strategy you have, the woman in the seminar said, you know, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And you can have the best laid plans of mice and men up on paper with all the great metrics, but if it's not in your blood, if it's not in your DNA, if the membership and the staff and the board and the officers and the leadership don't live it and breathe it, it's not going to succeed. It's just going to be platitudes and words on a page. So we're trying to fix the culture and improve the culture. And then lastly, as we were developing the long-term plan, what could we do? What could we get done in addition to those things? And I point to a few. And one of them is, I don't want to say controversial, but it certainly rubs some the wrong way. And it was the stance we took with uh, Rule 14-1B. And regardless of how you feel about that issue, and I'm torn on myself, being a golf, you know, someone who grew up with the game, I, you know, I understand both sides of it very well. That's not the point. The point was that the PGA of America raised its hand and said, we represent these 28,000 people. When there's a huge decision being made in golf, the PGA of America point of view needs to be heard. Because those 28,000 people, again, being the tangible connection between the game and everybody that plays it, they're the ones that are going to have to deal with it. The Mickey Gallagher's of the world and the other PGA professionals that are in this room. So let's do it in a cooperative way, let's do it in an informative way, but let's make sure that the golf industry takes notice that the PGA of America is going to raise its hand and make sure that we can bring that very educated, very diverse, geographically and else, uh, otherwise, point of view to the table. The relationship we created with NBC not so much from the revenue side, but I think one of the most important things our team did in the first few months was to renegotiate our agreement with NBC for the Ryder Cup and extend it through 2030. <clears throat> now granted, that shored up the financial health of the organization, but what strategically it allowed us to do was to dip into the Comcast network, a, fa a family of networks. And we, and this will start to, you'll start to see this when we celebrate our centennial in 16, when the deal really kicks in. We took a step back and said the mistake we've made that many in the golf industry have made historically is we talk about growing to the game, but we preach to the converted. So if you're waking up and watching Morning Drive at 7 o'clock or 6.30, like a lot of people in this room, you don't want to see an ad about Get Golf Ready, about how to be, if you're new to the game, how to get involved in the game, because you're a golfer if you're waking up and watching Golf Channel at that time. So how do we dip into programming that's dedicated toward women, or dedicated toward minorities, or dedicated to areas of the population that, we're, that we know are not playing golf, and show ads about Get Golf Ready, and Drive, Chip, and Putt, and PGA Junior League Golf? And then we made a revenue decision. We said, okay, now with this newfound revenue, we're a bit hamstrung in investing in our members, 
not to bore people here, maybe everybody would be bored except Brad, with, with a, because we're a 501c6 with the NERMAN issues, we can't directly monetarily benefit our members. But we said, let's take a large portion of this NBC money and distribute it over the course of years to our 41 sections. We have an annual uh, subsidy program with our sections and we laid out a plan to double that over the course of the next five years. And we also, I think, went about it in a proper way. We didn't go to somebody like Charlie, who's run this section so well, as I said, for over four decades, and said, Charlie, here's the money, but here's how you need to use it. That would have been parental on our part, that would have been narrow-minded, and that would have taken away all of the expertise and experience Charlie has about knowing how to utilize that money in this area for the maximization of the PGA members that he serves. And it's varied across the 41 sections. Some people, they've hired a new person, a business development uh, employee who can, who can drive business and revenue. Others have changed their headquarters. Others have kind of, when you talk about technology, brought new technology into their sections. But it was a great moment of time where we showed that, hey, we know at the section level, you know how to grow this game. What works in this part of the country is different than works what works in Southern California. The issues you're facing in this country are different than the issues you're facing in Texas. And that was a pivotal, I think, a really kind of key moment and a shift, if you will, in the approach of national towards sections that we're going to keep working on and, and trying to continue to increase. The other was the Women's PGA Championship. The PGA of America has a great story to tell in bringing women into the game. We, we need to do better. We need to do much better. We need more women participating in the game, as you heard Frank say this morning. We need more women in leadership positions at the PGA of America. After 99 years, we have our first female officer with Susie Whaley. We need more female PGA members. But we said, let's take a very strategic look and make sure that we put our resources and our efforts behind something big in this game. And let's, for the first time in nearly 100 years, support the women's game at the major championship level. And that was a key statement for us. That was saying, okay, and you'll see when I get into it with our long-term plan, if we're going to say we're about diversity and accessibility, if we're going to say we want to bring more women into this game, let's put our money where our mouth is and prove it. And women's golf is difficult on a major championship stage. We had a wonderful first year event this year at Westchester Country Club. Uh, it did enormously well, and relatively speaking, on television. The reaction of the leadership summit that KPMG put on with Condoleezza Rice as the keynote speaker was off the charts. But we all know the economic realities of championship uh, women's golf. Our good friend Mike Wan certainly lives that every day. But again, this was a strategic approach for our organization to head into a new century, our next century, with more, more of a diverse appeal. So as we were developing our long-term plan, we were trying to hit on these other items. And we took a step back and said, OK, what are we about? What should be the fundamental pillars of our long-term plan? What should be those critical tenets of what we're trying to do? And we said, let's not get too cute or too creative. It's all about two things, and I said them before. It's about serving our 28,000 members, and it's about growing the game. And if every decision we make, every action we take, comes back either directly or indirectly to those two guiding principles, we'll make more better decisions than we will bad decisions. And then we said, let's do a SWOT analysis. What are the strengths, the weaknesses, the opportunities, and the threats that are out there from an organizational way and then department by department? And it was a great, honest exercise where we self-graded ourselves. And where are we doing well, and where are we really not doing very well? And we found, you know what? We have Kerry Haig, a superstar in golf, running amazing championships. The way he sets up the golf course, the way he handles the relationships with the clubs, you saw that at Whistling Straits this year. You'll see it next year at, at Kevin's home at Baltusrol. We were doing some great things. The Ryder Cup, we had to tweak certain things. The Ryder Cup Task Force, which I think is starting to, to pay dividends, but, but the proof will be in the pudding as we go over the course of the next five, six years. But Curry could do certain things better, and we added a championship, like the Women's PGA Championship. We're putting more emphasis on our member events. But we graded that department very high. We looked 45 minutes north of where we're located and looked at Port St. Lucie, and we said, okay, here we are, the PGA of America, we're running 72 holes of golf, and we're embarrassed. They're not in the condition they should be. The business operation isn't where it needs to be. 
And what does that say about the PJ of America and the PJ of America brand? If we can't run a golf course in a way that would allow someone in this room to be proud of it, you know, that's not good enough. And we, did a, we took a long step and we said, let's make sure we bring the right people in. And it was also a lack of strategic direction. It wasn't necessarily the people in charge of the property. It wasn't necessarily the CEO at the time or the officers of the board. It was this tennis match of what the strategy should be. Let's make it as good conditioned as a private resort. Let's make it a public golf course. Let's have it so it can host winter championships. Let's sell it. And that just led to paralysis. So part of the plan was let's go out and hire some of the best people to run it and let's give them this blueprint so they know that there's a five, 10 year roadway where we can improve it. And I'd say where we initially graded that at about a D, we're probably closer to a B now. We've made operational changes. The condition is really as good as it's been over the course of the last decade. And it's finally something we're comfortable with. And that was key. And then we did this SWOT analysis for the entire organization. And we found that our strengths, our single greatest strength are our 28,000 members, that PGA brand. The fact that we run two of the biggest uh, five events in golf. The fact that we think we have the best educational platform for PGA professionals around the world. What are our weaknesses? We're an unbelievably domestic organization in a sport that's growing globally. What should we do about that? We found that some strengths are weaknesses. The fact that we run two of the five biggest events in golf, the fact that 95% of our revenue is derived from those two events is wonderful, but what if there's a weather issue? What are the exposures? What are the risks? People look back to Valhalla, this great championship with Ricky Fowler, Phil Mickelson, Henrik Stenson, obviously won eventually by Rory. This great dramatic moment made for television moment, the sun is setting, the last shot, you know, Rory taps out. You could not have hit another golf shot. Storybook ending ratings are the highest as they were, they were in 10 years. Everybody's high-fiving each other. Five minutes later, we're in trouble. We have to come back the next day. We hemorrhage money because we have to set the course back up. We have to bring the volunteers. We have to extend our contract with our vendors and the parking. Now you're finishing the PGA Championship while people are watching General Hospital and the ratings are, are down in the basement and we get criticized for not handling the weather delay properly. Now you have to have a good plan. Sometimes you have to get lucky. Our opportunities are we have these 28,000 people. How can we make their roles more meaningful? How can we spread our influence globally? And we'll see that's one of the eight critical tenets of our long-term plan. And then the threats. What are the threats to the golf industry? What are the threats to growing this game? What are the threats to being involved, obviously, in every element of a sport that maybe is counter to the current American psyche, where people have less time than ever? How can we pivot off of that? And then we put pen to paper, and we said we have to have buy-in. This can't be something that's just created by four or five senior staff people or by, or by me and the officers, but it had to be a draft then given to the officers, torn up, questions asked, vetted, brought to the board of directors through the same process, socialized with the past presidents to get their experience, ultimately taken to the section EDs and the section officers and had this comprehensive, simple, nimble plan of where should we go, what should we do. We purposely made it concise. We purposely said, we don't want to fall into the trap of so many strategic plans where you invent this unbelievably cumbersome document. And because it's 100 pages, it ends up in your desk drawer because everybody's intimidated by it. Let's have a 15-page document that any one of our members have time to read and can understand. That's simple and straightforward. Now, as you boil it down and you bring it back internally, and you take it from department to department, and you build staff plans and budgets and goals around it, sure, it turns into a 250, 300-page document. But let's not have that guiding text be too cumbersome. And then we, we really unveiled it at our annual meeting last year to say, OK, here's where we think we need to head. Here's the direction we think we need to go in. We understand we're going to have to call some audibles along the way. But if we do this, we think we're headed in the right direction. And we know that if we do this and follow this footprint, we're going to serve our members and grow the game. And I know uh, the clicker is here somewhere. I'll go through it. I'll touch on certain areas more than others in the sake of time. 
you know, what was so key to us, again, were these kind of the DNA of the plan. We said, how should it be influenced? And we came back to what might seem like simple terms, but we really try to live them and breathe them internally. It has to be a pursuit of excellence. It has to be innovative. There has to be a spirit of collaboration. And that collaboration wasn't there because we were siloed. And that's not rare in many organizations. But what we mean by collaboration, yeah, we have the business of the PGA Championship and the Ryder Cup and the senior and the women's, but we're here for the members. And if we're a hybrid organization, we're a weak organization. If those two areas work together, so when we do a major deal for the Ryder Cup, it benefits the membership, whether it be through education or employment or player development, that's the only way we're going to be successful. So we have to foster that spirit of collaboration. Certainly teamwork, which dovetails nicely into collaboration. And then diversity and inclusion. Everything we do, we need to be more diverse at the staff level. We need to be more diverse in the people who are participating in this game. We need more diversity in the membership ranks. You look at the, some of the charts that Frank put up earlier this morning and you see the trends of this population. If this game is going to stay relevant and increase its relevancy, it has to look different. And the PGA of America wants to be at the forefront of that. And then we develop this, this test, if you will, this internal test, that every decision we make, every major action we take, let's, let's ask ourselves these questions and see where we come out. Is what we're considering, does it protect and enhance the PGA brand? Does it help our members directly or indirectly? Sometimes that's easier than others to answer. Does it develop new golfers, promote the game of golf, and or make it more fun and enjoyable? Well, fun and enjoyable are words that you wouldn't have seen in our Constitution in 1916. Is golf fun if you're playing in the PGA Championship? You know, probably not. But should golf be fun for 99.9% .9 of the other people that play it? it? It better be, or we're in trouble. And that's critical position the PGA of America and our members as leaders in the business, teaching, and playing of the game. Those three terms probably took the most time in the development of this plan. Business, teaching, and playing. We're the self-proclaimed experts in the game of golf and the business of golf. But we took a step back and we heard this from our board and we heard this from our officers. Let's not lose sight, we can never lose sight of the playing and teaching. I know the business of golf really well, but I'm not a PGA professional. What separates me from Mickey Gallagher are those other elements. The playing of the game, the teaching of the game. That's what makes the PGA of America professional different from the rest of the world. We can't lose that, we have to foster that, we have to make sure that PGA of America professionals know, yes, you need to be smart about the business of the game or you're in trouble, but don't lose sight that it's a sport and you have to be able to play it, and you ought to be able to teach it. That is critical. Develop national and international growth and influence. The national was easy, the international was more difficult. We've historically been a very xenophobic organization, afraid to think outside of the borders. And we'll get to that when we talk about global. And then again, strengthen the perception of the PGA of America professional as that tangible connection between the game and everyone that plays it. That is so critical, and that really is our single greatest advantage. And then what are the eight key areas that we need to focus on? Now, there are service areas like legal, accounting, marketing, public relations, of course. But those are all here to serve these eight fundamental areas of this organization. So when we do strategic priorities, you will see that these are the eight areas, and elements of these eight areas keep coming back to the fore. The two most critical right out of the gate for us are, I don't know what's up here first, employment and education. There's nothing we can do that's more important for the PGA of America member than education and employment. And in turn, there's nothing more that we can do for growing the game than making sure we're hitting on all cylinders in this regard. And just quickly on employment, we've taken the, the take and the belief that we need to be uh, dealing more directly with the employers. Sure, we have to serve the needs of our members, but we have to help them communicate to their employers the value they bring. Why, you, why it would be a mistake not to have a PGA of America professional at your facility. How he or she drives revenue, drives all those opportunities and all those critical strategic functions that Frank mentioned. 
The PGA of America professional needs to be one of the key people at the center of that. And so our employment opportunities and our employment approach will certainly focus on the membership, but it's also going to start focusing far more heavily on the employer. Education. We think we have a very solid education curriculum, but how can we modernize it? How can we take advantage of technology and make it easier for our PGA members to stay educated and to offer different types of education, a different, more diverse curriculum, speaking skills, presentation skills, entrepreneurial skills, all of those key elements that will make the PGA of America professional more well-rounded, and technology. You will see from us in the next four to six months a very aggressive approach in technology. We think the PGA of America professional and the PGA of America as an organization needs to be at the center of technology in this game. Because what are the great teachable skills that the PGA of America professional needs over the course of the next 25, 50 years? He or she needs to be aimed, armed in this space coming into the workforce. Whether it's social media, whether it's all the teaching initiatives and devices that people are utilizing, wearable technology, we can't let the PGA of America professional be the owner of the corner record store. He or she needs to adapt with the changing times. And if I'm a PGA of America professional in a golf shop and an 18 year old comes in with a Fitbit and wants to talk about how many calories she's burning walking around the golf course, I better be able to have that conversation. And when you're talking about where this is going and what technology and the role technology will play in golf, it is going to be critical. I'm 44, and in many ways, I'm the final generation of people who will still be comfortable playing a game where you have to leave your phone in your car or in the locker. <clears throat> I have three kids. They won't play this game if that's the case. And I like to joke that phones, you know, kind of the last holdouts are church and golf. And church is 45 minutes. Golf is four hours plus. We're, we're, we're fighting a losing battle there. And granted, that will take, Kevin's staring at me now because he knows I'm staying at Baltusrol all week and I, I promise I won't use the phone on the golf course. But it's going to take time and it's cultural and it's not something that we can jam down the throat of the golf industry. But we have to be smart about it. And we have to understand that the generation behind us, the generation of my children who were seven, five, and two, they'll never be disconnected. And we can't expect them to be disconnected when they're on the golf course. And we're going to start implementing ways to utilize technology and master technology in our edu educational curriculum, not just for the members going up through our apprentice program and our PGA University approach, but also for the current crop of PGA of America professionals so they can be better armed for the future. Properties, I talked a little bit about Port St. Lucie and the changes and, and improvements we've made there. Valhalla has developed this great championship pedigree in a short amount of time. What can we continue to do to improve Port St. Lucie? And what can we continue to do to establish Valhalla as one of the great championship sites around this country? What can we do to have it really foster and experiment and grow the game initiatives? These are the types of things you'll start to see at our properties. Player development. And this is one I, I know I'm running out of time, but one I do want to spend a few minutes on. We had made the mistake historically of a new initiative, a new campaign, a new fancy acronym with splashy marketing materials year after year after year. And you could tell our membership was saying, hey, we've never been busier. We've never been more under the gun. We can't keep pace with these new initiatives. So we took a step back and said, let's kind of clean this. Let's not continue to just put layer upon layer on the house because the house is going to cave in. What do we believe in? What do we think can work? And let's stick with it. Not for a year or two years, but for 10 years, 15 years. And let's go from literally 81 programs to three. And those are Drive, Chip, and Putt in partnership with the USJ and Augusta National. Get Golf Ready, you know, simplest form, five lessons, $99 for new people into the game. And PGA Junior League Golf. Boys and girls, seven to 13, golf shirts with numbers on the back of them. Uh, uh, alternate uh, formula where the, it's such a non-intimidating way to get involved in the game. We have ambassadors in Michelle Wee, Ricky Fowler, and Rory McElroy, and we said let's put our efforts on these programs because we really think they can move the needle, particularly PGA Junior League Golf. We think that's going to have a profound impact on the growth of the game. And that's a more, I would say, traditional approach to growing the game. Let's focus on these programs, let's grow them, let's put our weight behind them. Let's not bemoan sections from doing their own campaigns that may be working in their areas or the great ideas that PGA of America's members have around the country. Let's learn from them 
And these three, for instance, weren't developed in some think tank at the PJ of America. These were lessons and ideas and concepts we learned from our membership around the country that were working at their facilities, their clubs, and in their areas, and then we take and put the resources of national behind them. And if that's a traditional approach, let's also have a non-traditional approach. Let's make sure that we can make this funnel into the game as welcoming and as all-encompassing as possible. And we use the internal analogy of basketball. If we understand that we feel that the major impediment to growth of this game is time, you can, uh, accessibility, difficulty, there's a lot of reasons, but time we feel is number one. And we use the basketball analogy. I could go out this afternoon, Steve and I could play one-on-one. -on -one. We could grab Jay, who's a heck of a basketball player, and Charlie and play two-on-two. -two. We could play a game of horse for 30 or 45 minutes and have a blast. And we'd get done and we'd say, hey, that was fun, we played basketball. And it doesn't have to be five on five on a regulation court for four, min four 12 minute quarters with a referee. Golf, we penalize ourselves by defining participation through pretty archaic terms. We have no intention of changing the be all experience of golf. There's nothing more enjoyable than going out with three people whose company you enjoy and playing a great golf course like many of us will this afternoon. There's no replacing that, that's the magic of the game. But let's understand that we better have 30, 50, hour and a half type experience for people who don't have the four hours or the four and a half hours, just to whet their appetite. That could be taking a lesson from a PGA professional. That could be playing three holes after work with your spouse or your, 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 your children. That could be going to a top golf and beating balls for an hour. And really, when you think about it, whether you're playing golf this afternoon at Baltus Roll, or you're going to a driving range and hitting golf balls for 30 minutes, <clears throat> or you're taking a short game lesson from your PGA professional, you're playing golf and you're a golfer. And let's make sure we make that avenue into the game, those experiences as diverse and accessible as possible. Because once you get people into that funnel, we won't convert them at all, all of them, but the, but the magic of the game will, will convert them into golfers. So the traditional disciplined approach combined with a non-traditional approach to offer a more diverse sampling of what it means to get introduced to this game. PGA Reach, I'll be quick here, is our foundation. It struck me as odd that a 99-year-old organization really didn't have a fully functioning charitable arm. We looked at so many of our sections and what they were doing so well, and we said, hey, we better learn a lesson from them. And we created PGA Reach. We recruited one of the great EDs, the New Jersey ED, who many of you know, Scott Kimmick, to come down and run it for us. And already in Scott's two years, this has taken hold and really starting to pay dividends. And this is another example of us saying, we don't have all the answers. Let's look at what our own members are doing and our own sections are doing so well and replicate it. Sections, I think I, I've said a lot here, I probably covered this pretty fully. It's gotta be a dialogue. We're not going to be smart unless we're listening and learning from our sections. There is no way we know what's going on in this area as well as the people who live and breathe this area every day. We can be smarter. We're part of the same organization. If we truly create a trust relationship, a dialogue back and forth between Palm Beach Gardens and our 41 sections around the country, that's where the PGA of America really becomes uh, palpable and championships. How can we continue to make our championships some of the very best in the world? How can we continue to elevate the PGA Championship? How can we continue to modify the Ryder Cup? Just briefly, I mean, many people have heard about the Ryder Cup Task Force, and really it's no great science. It was just us taking a step back and saying, okay, over the course of the last 20 years, we've gone two and eight. That's not good enough. And we can't allow that to happen for the next 20 years because one or both of these things will happen. It will certainly become less relevant, and that's not good. And there's a bit of a trust between the PGA of America and the American golfing public that we know how to run the Ryder Cup. And if we go two and eight over the course of the next 20 years, that trust is gonna be jeopardized and we might be forced to cede control. So the relevancy and the fact that let's make sure we give some lowercase ownership to the great players who are part of the Ryder Cup, the great past captains, and make them part of this process. And let's not reinvent the wheel every two years. Let's develop a program. 
the great programs in sports, whether it's the Notre Dame football, the New York Yankees, Dallas Cowboys, you name it, it's because it's a program. It's because the great influences and people of the past help educate the current crop of people and they don't force themselves to reinvent the wheel. So that's where we're headed with the Ryder Cup. And then certainly with the creation of the KPMG Women's PGA Championship. The, trying to bring more attention to what we're doing with our professional national championship. It was a very strategic decision to take that to the Philly Cricket Club. The reaction of our players was off the charts. We need to do a better job saying, look at these people playing golf at an exceptional level who also have full-time jobs and do everything that's called for, upon them to do at their club. That's a great message for the PGA of America that we need to do a better job uh, teaching. And then lastly, I just want to touch on global. What can we do from a global influence? How do we come to terms with the fact that as a domestic organization, sure, we're the PGA of America. I don't know the percentage. Is it 90, 95% of what we do needs to be geared domestically? That's up for debate. But I've said to the board that the biggest mistake we can make is if we wake up 20 years from now and realize that we've had our head in the sand and this game has gone global and we've stayed back and watched it. If you look at the PGA Tour, who's really the holy Roman empire of golf right now, acquiring golf organizations all around the world. If you look at the LPGA, which is international out of necessity, the work the USGA and the RNA have done to, to uh, increase the, in their, their international influence, we need to do the same. And we feel that the best opportunity for that is through education and employment. When we poll our 28,000 members, roughly 5,000 of them raise their hand and say, yeah, I'd be interested in an international opportunity. Maybe not for 20 years, maybe for three or four. And I know that if I was a young PGA of America professional and there was a great opportunity in some other part of this world to grow the game, to bring the great educational platform of the PGA of America professional, much like, an, like a domestic university going international. Let's bring that curriculum overseas so we can educate their own people to become PGA professionals and create employment opportunities for our professionals at the same time. And let's make sure that we take advantage of the Olympic movement now that there are government dollars subsidizing golf in countries are, that are developing golf and developing nations, not from a socioeconomic sense, but from a golf sense. The PGA of America has to be there to influence that and to grow that. So we're just getting started with this long-term strategic plan. We think it's pretty purposely simple in its approach, tied to growing the game and serving the members, a more disciplined avenue to where we want to head. We're, we, we certainly understand that we're going to have to call audibles along the way, as I said, because that's part of the plan. But if we stick to this mission, if we create a true back and forth between the organization and our 28,000 members, we know we can serve them effectively and we know we can grow the game. So I'm looking at my watch, I was told to finish up by 11.45, so I know I'm a little over, but if we have a second, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to, to try to answer them. absolutely will have to adhere to an Olympic standard. Uh, there is pretty stringent drug testing that goes, in, goes on in golf already on the men and women's side. So we feel relatively very confident about it in terms of the players who you see playing each and every week because they're used to it. There are other nations uh, that aren't as savvy to the drug testing and to the drug rules where it could become an issue. The Olympic formula was a combination of making sure it was the very best golfers in the world, as many of the top players in the world as possible, but balancing that with representing as many nations as possible. So when you sneak out into those nations that don't have as much influence and really presence on the week in and week out golf scene on both the PGA Tour and the LPGA Tour, the risk of that popping up increases. But they have, we, they have been very well educated that if you plan to participate in the Olympics, you better be clean. Um, I was surprised to see that um, 
he didn't mention the allied uh, associations. Maybe he did in the uh, developing the game. What could you? Because I'm yeah. critical of my own association in that regard sometimes. I think it's better, but I don't think that's all the different entities here that we always get together the same way. No, it's okay. I'm glad you brought it up. I would tell you, I, you know, having been at the USGA for 11 years and knowing the USGA so well, and you know, I, I mentioned Jay and Charlie and Gene, the person who has had the most direct influence on me professionally by a mile is David Fay. So, you know, I, I think the world of the USGA. I would say for the first time since I've been involved in golf at an executive level, and I started at the USGA in 2000, the type of meetings we've had among those entities, the USGA, the LPGA, Augusta National, the Tour, the RNA, the European Tour, have never been better. This has really been over the course. I would say coming out of the wake of 14-1B, we started these initiatives and these meetings where we said, okay, everybody kind of check your egos out the door. And we really focused on growing the game. Because whether you're the PGA of America or the USGA or the Tour, we all want the game to grow. And we all came in with all our Grow the Game initiatives. And we had already been through this process of going from 81 to 3. And as a group, we said, OK, we all have these different initiatives. If you're a consumer, you don't know who's who. It's just acronym alphabet soup. What are the initiatives we can agree on? And let's make sure we stay consistent in promoting them. So whether you're watching the US Open or uh, Barclays or the Ryder Cup, you're going to hear about these initiatives. And they're PGA Junior League Golf, they're Drive, Chip, and Putt, they're Get Golf Ready, they're the USGA LPGA Girls on Course, then they're the first team. And then in a different regard, not so much a Grow the Game initiative, but a very important initiative nonetheless is sustainability. So you'll hear from us over and over, regardless of whose telecast you're watching or whose newsletter you might be reading or, or, or bringing up on your app, we're gonna stay committed to those initiatives over the course of the next few years. And that spirit of cooperation has, has really been great. Uh, it's had its ebbs and flows over the history of the organizations, but in this last 18 month period to 24 months, I, I, in my opinion, it's been at an all time high. Thank you all. Thanks, Pete. Thanks so much for coming up. Pete's such a great talent. So much fun that he came from this area, and he has so many pearls of wisdom to drop on us. Thank you very much.